So I'm delighted to um, uh, um, introduce our next speaker um, after that wonderful presentation. Sophia Pirandello um, is a PhD student in aesthetics at the Department of Philosophy of the University of Milan. Her research areas include aesthetics, cognitive sciences, philosophy of technology, the theory of media and contemporary art. <clears throat> she graduated in 2018, 2018 with a dissertation about the relevance of imagination in our everyday life, taking into account also specific cases such as literature and schizophrenia. She attended Campo, the art curator course held by Fondizioni Sandretto Rivandego. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's very of Turin. Uh, she is currently working on a PhD thesis about augmented reality feedback on human imagination, investigating its pros and cons from an aesthetical point of view, and also considering its political implications, of which there are many. So lovely. I give First you. Well, thank you for your wonderful presentation, and thank you for having invited me here. As maybe it's easy to infer from the title I chose, uh, I devoted my research to the link between augmented reality and the human imagination. And if I had to summarize my research work in a nutshell, it would be does augmented reality as a technology in any way alter our imagination? And I think that to go deeper into this question, I should give you some like a um, uh, basic definition of what I understand as imagination and what I understand as augmented reality, because both of them are not very, we're not very on the same page. Uh, usually we had a very deep discussion yesterday about imagination. But we agreed. Yeah, <laughs> in the end we went to it. <laughs> That's not easy at all. <laughs> and uh, well, in my research work, I have, uh, let's say, embraced cognitive anthropology perspective, according to which imagination is not imagery, meaning the internal simulation of visual information seen via the mind's eye or the mind's mind. And there's a lot of scholars that would discuss imagination this way. Here you have a few references. And in this sense, I don't believe imagination should be um, explained through a pictorialist or a, a, a propositional account. That means that I don't believe imagination contents are like pictures or sentences in the head. Um, and it is not an offline private mental process as some cognitive scholars would hold, meaning that when, some when someone is talking about an offline private mental process, he or she means that it is a process that activates while you're not, in you're not in engaged in any pr um, practical activity. Uh, I rather believe that imagination is an exploration and reconfiguration of the environment, meaning exactly the opposite. So imagination should be as this kind of perspective uh, would, would hold um, as a practical online, online while experiencing the world, thinking grounded into the body of the individual and in it. Uh, in her and his interaction with other bodies, other objects, and the environment. And, and this is why, basically, why I ended up in this, with this strange uh, world, imagine action, uh, because I wanted to uh, stress that action and imagination are not independent or separate processes. And they both are linked to bodily, sensory, motor experience of the individual, as well as with uh, a technology that mediate um, the encounter with the world. And here you have a very famous reference to Alvin Owen work. And this is um, uh, Action in Perception, where he basically states something similar, because it says that online and offline mental processes, action, perception, imagination, and so on, are very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish, if not on a theoretical level. But what about augmented reality? Because we started to discuss a little bit about augmented reality. I basically agree with you, except for the fact that maybe I will consider uh, what you've shown as the history of augmented reality as archaeology of augmented reality, meaning the repetition of the same, the same idea. 
but I, I prefer to focus on the, let's say, the digital version. And, um, and I provide you with this definition, a form of computer-mediated reality that superimposes images into the view of a user. And this means that in this definition, I would um, comprehend also what sometimes is referred to as mixed reality, because you are in, interacting with 3D complex digital objects. But to me, there is no actual real um, difference because we are talking both in both uh, situations of superimposition of images, being then written texts or be three-dimensional complex objects onto our agential space. And since the term first um, at first um, was conceived, which is actually one, um, 1992, but this is another uh, very important. Um, paper I refer to in my work, uh, AI was not intended to replace the concrete environment, but to add, uh, let's say, more affordances into it, uh, more electronical uh, functions. And so here we have Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> Just to show that this, this is, uh, I think, this is the most the, the simplest version of augmented reality, but there already are uh, glasses such such as the Microsoft HoloLens 2, or headsets, which are those that, that permit the see-through version of augmented reality. Other kind of devices, such as the Distelix Active Look series, are on their way. They're more, they're lighter and more near-eye kind of uh, devices, as well as other form of uh, more experimental tools that are those, especially those involved in touch and very, they're very rarely on the market. So they're more on a prototypical level. And I would include in this kind of uh, group, very interesting though, even if, if at a prototypical level, the, um, the, the uh, contact lenses, because they, they will be um, interesting uh, a little bit after. Um, so um, no matter the differences between the different kind of devices, I would give some um, something that they share, at least, that they need to be innervated in the body of the user, being then wearable or, um, or portable, it depends. And, and they just work uh, as related to a given context, meaning that even if we are talking about digital objects, they're real because they're in the world and they they... Uh, works just as we refer to a physical context um, in order to provide information, to expand or reduce, because there's also diminished reality, which is something that is not really there, but it, sometimes uh, sometimes somebody takes in consideration even this possibility. Um, well, the, the subject and the objects with which to interact. Uh, mainly to sketch out possible designing and uh, well operational situations. So it, is, it can be used for very simple tasks such as communicating with, with the avatar or the quasi-olegans of friends and relatives to go shopping on the internet, but uh, especially they present themselves as assistants for tool designing, object making, repairing. And even if today I'm not going to talk about that, mainly during war. And this is something we should maybe consider uh, in, our, in another maybe uh, seminar. <laughs> and I consider augmented reality to be a technology of the imagination because it allows for the modification of reality using an image interface. So it's a, basically a tool environment manipulation which engages the individual's entire body and it involves exploration, interpretation, and reconfiguration of surroundings. But I have to admit that this is not just something that I ended up with out of the blue, because many, many well-renowned scholars have already investigated the link between imagination and, let's say, digital technologies. Not all of them are addressing augmented reality in particular. And I would divide them into Though those that have that hold a pessimistic view, uh, such for example Richard Kearney and Jonathan Crary, and those are a little bit more optimistic because Kearney, a little bit back in the days, he does not refer to augmented reality, but he says that postmodern era in general entails the destruction of human imagination. 
While Jonathan Crary said there is nothing good nor even creative or political in digital technology, and you, in, you will call anybody here in this room as a watchdog of capitalism, because you shouldn't um, well talk about this this field, he says. Um, while Pietro Montani is a little bit more uh, uh, optimistic because he um, stated that augmented reality would likely empower our imagination, uh, thanks to the possibility it gives of uh, participating into the shared archive the internet is. Um, I also collected others, well, well there are more of course, but uh, others um, proposals such as the one by Nicola Liberati, who says that this melting of different point of view on the same perspective would result into a common identity, which he calls we I. Mm -hmm. And Khalid Wellner, who says that basically our imagination is turning itself past human because it works just on uh, digitally mediated information. She uses a slippery kind of definition of imagination because it's like we use till now a natural imagination and then we have a post human imagination, which is something I don't agree with, but it's interesting. And obviously, I think. All these accounts are very interesting, especially those, according to me, referring to possibilities for augmented reality. But they all share, to, according to me, um, a, a problem because they tend to be very straightforward answer, yes or no. The um, augmented reality is good for imagination or no imagination will be completely erased. And I think in order to answer my first question, does augmented reality modify our imagination? we should ask more questions. Which device are we considering? Uh, what kind of users, uh, user, user we are? And which project we are taking into consideration? To be fair, Montani recognizes that there are two different paths uh, possible, but my feeling is that he suggests that they are um, one or the other. We are not facing both. While I think at the moment we have evidence that both criticalities and possibilities are at stake. So, for example, uh, let's focus on vices. We, meaning uh, Professor Pinotti, Michael Lee, Roberto Malaspina and I, already have um, a tentative uh, well, analysis of what we have at our disposal now. And um, Professor Pinotti already described this ca kind of uh, para-hallucinatory character, another strange way of not defining something uh, because we yeah another escape room because we realized that this kind of devices present themselves as objects in the world so even if they implement a user-friendly interface of course we still recognize them as something that we are using in order to modify the world we are like a um, we are having an um, uh, interactive relation with this, so they're a little bit different, slightly different to the hyper mediation, the invisible hyper mediation, immersive virtual reality uh, decided itself for. Um, and so, for example, Noam Elkot has suggested to consider a form of contemporary phantasmagoria, meaning like an assemblage of human beings and images in the same space in real time. Be uh, the imaging, uh, the image accessing our world, therefore. But for example, consider these other scenarios. We are not there, so it's not possible to say more than just a possible tentative hypothesis. But what if smart contact lenses and very light near eye augmented reality would replace smartphone? To me, it's very possible that the difference between immersive and immersive would likely disappear and that the immersive uh, pole would undergo into a paradoxical transformation into its immersive um, opposite. Because of course, in this situation, this is an advertising from Mojo Lens, which is um, augmented reality lenses um, enterprise, uh, that, that obviously the, um, the interface still be there, the physical world would still be there, but we I think we would struggle to recognize it, uh, especially after a time, using it as not natural data. And this is something that, according to some scholars, could a little bit uh, modify the way we, inter we, we interact with other things. So Tim Ingold would say that we will lose the most important thing for creative 
like process. And and there already have we already have some studies about a sort of a schizophrenic feeling engaging this way with technology. So Jeffrey Scones actually uh, focused on uh, TV, but then he uh, also analyzed this way um, digital technologies, uh, meaning. When when I when I call a schizophrenic when I speak of a, a schizophrenic feeling, I uh, refer to the tendency of losing oneself boundaries between us and the uh, technology, us and the the world. But there are also differences in terms of the user, because of course um, Lambert Dieting, for example, suggested to consider any non-immersive tech user an imaginator, meaning someone that is free to modify the image interface as freely as you would modify your imagination. But I think this is a case that applies to this kind of devices, because of course, in this situation, if you are, if you are a, a highly specialized user, you can really shrink, widen, disassemble, reassemble, modify in general, these kind of objects with directly with your hands, with your eyes movements and the other movements of the body. And this for sure reduces some cognitive load during the uh, creative process because it's a kind of a trial and error. I think Bruno yesterday told something about um, these trial and error processes um, for taking notes with digital ma matter. But what about this situation? Because if you are an everyday user that just use the IKEA app or the L'Oreal app or related stuff like this, this kind of project do present an engaging character, but even if you are called to envision the future look of your dining room or your face, you're also very well instructed on how to do this. So it's a little bit strange. How can we call this really an empowerment of imagination? And it feels like magic is something that we keep repeating also as scholars. And also I find this kind of work referring to magic, superpowers, supernatural uh, um, magic uh, feeling of whatever in the advertising and all the official websites. But something I think it's very important to underline is that this magical feeling is made possible just because of what very provocative, provocatively Luke Mann called dirty matters, meaning minerals and dirty workers, people who are there day by day doing very repetitive tasks. And this means uh, automation of work, which is necessary for technologies such as this, is not replacing human beings, not for the good nor for the bad. It's just we're asking us for a reorganization of our um, using the machine. So it's a kind of a compromise more than just a replacement. And I think that it's very important to consider this such of underground work under the apparently celestial image interface, just in order for understand how directly and indirectly augmented reality would uh, modify our imagination. And I would going uh, towards a conclusion say that, uh, however, I do think that there are um, fields where imagination could be empowered to a greater extent. And I see in this direction, for example, it's not the only one, but for example, augmented reality activism <laughs> which is done in, to the advantage of the collective participation because it inherits uh, some kind of strategies that have already been there because of networks and platforms such as YouTube, Instagram, Telegram, Signal, and so on. And that it is used mostly through, as accessed mostly through smartphone. And this is something that maybe should consider because smart glasses are just there for little privileged groups, at least at the moment. So I don't know what about the future, but this is what's now. So briefly, augmented reality has been used political since 2010 with this New York collective manifesto yarn. At first at MoMA and then they took part into the Occupy Movement protests. And since then, uh, augmented reality has been used many, many times with many uh, different ways, like QR codes, mobile applications such as these um, in New York as well. 
And as far as I'm concerned, the archive is the most interesting one, the augmented connected archive. There are already a lot of them, uh, lots of them, and already there are platforms that study this kind of archive. So archive of the archives and uh, very long history. And this is the one I was talking about to you, I think. I don't have obviously time to go deep in any of these um, projects, but this is just to show that even very famous artists has like chosen this kind of uh, projects. Um, the most interesting so far to me is this one, the Augmented Archive, because it's an ongoing work you can access in place, but you can also implement. So you can use their maps, their images, their videos, uh, documenting protests in, uh, um, in this case in Cairo. But if you want, you can add more uh, to the archive. So it's an ongoing collective work. and. Every archive is collected in some way, whether it's open to the to the public or to a small group. But it's all every time it's collective. And of course, this kind of activism has been very much criticized because it's said to be an armchair activism, which is completely useless, which discourages others from others from of activism. But I would say that this is not the case because. It is not conceived to substitute products in presence. It's just another tool beside other, other tools we have. And with the pro that it keeps worldwide uh, people worldwide tuned on a specific uh, topic, especially in contexts where you are not very free to uh, participate in person to the protest. You don't have the right to receive information. So uh, it's, uh, that, that is the best. Uh, in the best uh, uh, environment to use this kind of technologies. So to conclude, I would say that, of course, augmented reality has, well, studying this stuff means that you have to face a lot of problems, mainly those, for example, that are inherited from the internet itself, because it is a form of public space, which is paradoxically held by private entrepreneurs. You have to afford technologies. Technologies get very, uh, very, easily obsolete, so it poses problems in terms of sustainability on any level. But I think the most important thing, even when you ask an aesthetics question, is whose imagination? When, when I ask, is this, um, to what extent is this uh, useful for our imagination? And because, of course, augmented reality is feeding social inequalities. But I think that the good news is it could be used even for creative resistance, artworks, and other stuff. So I think as any other uh, real project has its pros and cons. Well, I'm done. Uh, finish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>